So yeah, um, thanks very much for attending, I guess the, the second panel of the day. Um, so um, I will basically be moderating with Mike who is also here um, and uh, Basically, so yeah, I, um, I'm Darwin. I'm a research scientist at Netflix, works on recommendations and uh, sometimes Bayesian, sometimes non Bayesian. And also I care about causality, which is why I'm here. Um, so today in our panel, this is gonna be about the, it, it's gonna be a applied panel as opposed to the first one, which is very theoretical. And uh, we have a pretty high level direction, which is um, set by David. Um, is Bayesian inference suitable in production? Um, I think it's a, a rather open-ended question and I hope we can have a pretty um, lively discussion here. I guess first we can have uh, each panelist to, to introduce themselves. And uh, while you are doing that, you can also, just like in the first panel, um, also say that where you would place yourself in the Bayesian, non-Bayesian spectrum a bonus point if you actually want to pretend you have a different persona and to play that out, it's up to you. Um, so since we actually don't have like a physical panel, so um, th there is not really a natural ordering of like panelists introducing themselves. I would just call in them one by one based on the order appear on my screen. Um, so we'll start with Chen. Um, I mean, she has already been introduced, but if you have anything additional you want to say and also place yourself on the spectrum, that would be great. Uh, hi, uh, yes, I have been introduced. I'm from Microsoft. Uh, so uh, it's hard to, to place on the spectrum because you need to get a definition of how to be patient, right? And that's already hard. But if anyone have been tracked my web page before, uh, under my name, there's a sentence, I'm a part-time patient. <laughs> And I think that says I'm part-time patient. I think I'm potentially, if I range from one to 10 out of thin air, I'll place myself to be like seven. <laughs> okay, okay. So we're on 10 point skill then. Okay, uh, that's good to know. Um, so um, next we have uh, James. So James will give a talk later in the day about the very interesting topic. So he will be properly introduced, but uh, I guess for now he can introduce himself a little bit and also place himself on the spectrum. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm a research scientist at Netflix also, a uh, colleague of Darwin's. Um, so uh, I got into Bayesian modeling when I, during my PhD, modeling uh, spatial temporal data sets. Um, it always seemed to me that, you know, they were gonna make an impact in industry it, they would need to be scalable, these Bayesian methods that, that I was working on. So I spent a few years in a postdoc working on variational, variational methods. Uh, and then about five years ago, I, I entered industry and um, confronted with a series of, you know, deeply causal questions when deciding what, you know, what items to show on your homepage. Um, so, so that's kind of uh, how I kind of got into that. And uh, just, yeah, really thinking about those questions. Um, and yeah, I'm really enjoying the the workshop so far. So thanks very much to the organizers. Uh, in terms of Bayesianism, um, I mean, I don't want to sound facetious, but I, I feel like I'm outside the, the spectrum because, I mean, it's the only way that I really understand things, you know, the Bayesian perspective, um, which you might take that as extreme, but it's, um, uh, I feel like uh, it's, uh, it's just a lens through which I, I view machine learning methods in general. And, um, you know, and maybe I'll come back to that point later in the discussion. Okay, looking forward to it. So then next we have uh, Diago. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and also place yourself on the spectrum? Hi, yes. Uh, so my name is Diego Legrand. I'm a machine learning engineer at uh, Criteo. Um, I work on, on uh, recommendation problems. So trying to figure out what product to show to what, in what context or to what user and we display um, millions of ads per day, and so so hopefully I can bring a, a non-academic but production-heavy uh, perspective on uh, uh, onto the panel. And um, yeah, Bayesian, Bayesian Lee, I'm I'm an aspiring Bayesian. I, I think Bayesian Lee, but uh, I have other constraints like uh, scale, and so I fall often short of being purely Bayesian. But I try to be as Bayesian as I can. I mean, yes, having different perspective is exactly why we're having this panel discussion. So welcome. 
Thank you. And uh, next we have uh, Ralph. And uh, so can you also introduce yourself and uh, yeah, do the same like page and spectrum placement thing. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm Ralph Herbrick. I'm currently um, at Zalando. I worked at uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Research, Facebook and Amazon before. Um, I had the luck, maybe I was uh, lucky um, and then I was able to actually put Bayesian algorithms into production um, in a gaming context and an online advertising context. So uh, I actually found them highly practical, but challenging um, in the definition in sort of uh, getting others, getting the vast majority of people to understand. Um, but how would I put myself on a scale? I think I put myself on the applied science on an eight and on the theory size more on a two. I'm, uh, I'm more a believer in the frequentist school when it comes to the theory of learning. Okay. And uh, I also just want to mention that when I was in grad school, I was very Bayesian and I was also a gamer. I'm still a gamer. So seeing the Xbox matchboxing paper was uh, a, a defining moment for myself. Anyway, um, okay, next we have uh, uh, John. Too. Oh, okay, good. Um, so next we have John Lambert, who has already been introduced in the earlier panel and also needs no introduction. But uh, um, if you want to add a little bit in the context of, I don't know, putting something in production system, you can also. Uh, so I guess in terms of putting things in production systems, we have things in a production system in a way which you could use if you wanted to. So if you go to aka.ms slash personalizer, you can go get your own little contextual bandit loop, which will do learning for you. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's a lot of fun and it's seeing a fair number of applications. And then in terms of uh, where I am on the Bayesian perspective, I guess I, I don't consider myself Bayesian, but it, it's fair to say that I've been Bayes curious at times. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, so, okay. And uh, so the, the topic is about um, is Bayesian suitable in production system? I guess this topic is, I guess, intentionally being vague because um, um, first of all, Bayesian inference can be used in really different contexts. And also um, production system can really mean a lot of things, even though I guess to most of the panelists here, it means some um, form of interact, interactive systems, specifically like recommender system. And, uh, but I guess for trends specifically, it's probably also can be more about in some other domain of application healthcare and stuff. So um, I, I think basically that the, the hope is we can be maybe um, providing different perspectives and uh, move along in that direction. Um, so I guess we will start by asking some um, again, intentionally provoking, provocative, provocative questions um, so that we can get the, the, the conversation started. Um, I guess if you look at, I guess, the recent literature or even literature in general, you can see kind of a pretty um, interesting line of research which try to provide easy way to say like a Bayesianize um, a standard approach uh, like Nowadays, like a stand, like Bayesian is a deep learning model. And uh, sometimes you can hear claims like you can get uncertainty for free. Uh, I'm just quoting the talk that I heard. Um, so in production system, if we have already like routinely put complicated deep learning system in the production system, and also if you ever been to like SML or NeurIPS workshop about um, like uh, uncertainty and stuff, you will see that people at least like to claim that they care about uncertainty. So if that's the case, then what's actually stopping us from putting more Bayesian inference, Bayesian principle into the production using really the same technical stack that we would put deep learning system in the production system. Um, so I guess that will be the first question I will throw to the panelists. And uh, uh, Ralph, you mentioned that you actually put Bayesian in the production system. So I would like to hear what you want to say about that. Yeah, so um, uh, maybe the one I'm talking about, because uh, uh, I think you yourself and uh, James, if I'm not mistaken, have uh, commented on it. Um, so the example or that I'd like to use is that of TrueSkill, a system where you basically have pairwise comparisons um, that come uh, that are the outcome of 
online games being played. Um, and you'd like to uh, basically build a service that takes those single bits or partial orders um, and updates what the system believes is the skill of every individual that was responsible for the outcome, every individual gamer. And uh, let me, I think when we talk about production systems, I kind of feel there's four um, dimensions that are that make a, a system running in production. So the first one is I think it has to be performant. Um, it has to be effectively, uh, you know, it cannot cost more to run it than the value it brings in the long run. And it wouldn't really run in production. Um, it has to be auditable and needs to be audited because it typically runs 24 seven and, uh, um, you know, and except for in contrast to ad hoc analysis, production systems do not really go to sleep or run occasionally. It has to be debuggable because um, uh, no system is perfect, there'll be mistakes um, and uh, there needs to be a way to understand what was going wrong and then teachable to, to sustain because uh, when it's in production, typically in, in, uh, in products that run built by companies, they don't tend to have the same employees. So over time, um, there needs to be a way for new hires in the team to understand how the system is working. And I think we're, um, we're where there's the challenges with Bayesian systems is the, when you, when you don't do it carefully, is the performance. So the naive way so to slap a, a sampling um, right over a, a, a analytical, like a forecasting system um, is typically making it slow. So one of the things I found that are important is to really think about approximate inferences that retain the, the performances, um, the performant execution. I think what's really nice is that they're easier, much more easier to debuggable when something goes wrong because you have to have a forward model of your data. Um, you know, it's not just a function approximation. So when something goes wrong, it's a, I found that in probabilistic or Bayesian systems, it's much more easy to find out what's the root cause of an incorrect prediction. And they're also easier to audit, but what uh, makes them hard is they're much more difficult to teach. Um, I found that generally when you work with a vast you know, not just with, um, with uh, researchers that are working in the domain of uh, Bayesian inference, they find it very hard to comprehend uh, the idea that a number is, you know, you have an uncertainty with every one of the parameters, in the predictive case, but also in the internal parameters associated with it, and why to keep it around. It seems like a, a waste of memory. And so the teachability is harder and the performance needs careful attention, but I think the auditability and the, the debuggability is, is much easier and, uh, and therefore I think often um, for making it put in production, um, that's advantageous. So that's, that's my findings. Uh, I'll stop here and let others weigh in. I would just say, uh, I really like the summary. I cannot agree more than that. That's seeing really uh, every day, no, uh, no that. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, I just uh, want to, to enhance a little bit on the performance. I think sometimes, I mean, being Bayesian is, uh, what does it mean being, being Bayesian? I don't think being Bayesian means setting prior for every single parameter you have. And then I think that's another question you want to ask. So I think Ralph has a really good summary you know, of all these criteria, but like then as sometime you want to ask yourself, why do you want to be in Bayesian for any application? Do you need to be in full Bayesian? I mean, there are situations, I, I think for research, I think we can have like theoretical advantage and a lot of things we can argue about, but when it's in production system, I think performance, uh, like what the end users need is a key. We don't want to make things just uh, in some way more correct or uh, that to, to like to consider the cost of like user experience and everything. And I, I believe the question is how, like how to say, one to being patient and in which situa situation we have to be in Bayesian without being Bayesian. It, it doesn't work anymore. And I believe there are situations like that. Right. Uh, um, I, I was in a situation like that. Uh, well, the first time I was confronted to the, the Bayesian problem was when doing multivariate A-B testing. So you had 10 different versions of a website and you wanted to see 
uh, when do you have enough confidence to declare that one of them converts at a higher rate than others? And this, the, the current state of the system was a frequentist uh, system, and they had the problem of declaring winners too early, saying, oh, no, uh, 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 it, when you let the data run for longer, you realize, oh, it was actually not performing better than the other ones. And shifting the frame of mind to Bayesian and framing it as with a prior and then computing distributions and posteriors and in, in, a, in a Bayesian way helps uh, really solve that problem. Uh, so, so it, I know that it can happen in, in production that, that you know, a Bayesian approach uh, helps. I don't know if it is, if, if it is as uh, interactive as, as the uh, systems you're talking about, but... Uh, um, so, could I, I'd like to add a little bit. So, um, may, may I speak? Oh, sure, sure. I just saw like Ralph, did you like to raise the hand, right? That's fine. Just put me in the queue. I just raise it so okay. you know I'm in the queue. But John speak, should speak next. I spoke already for five minutes. OK, sure. Yeah. So uh, with regards to Ralph's desiderata, I think they're, they're good. Uh, I guess the only quibble, quibble I might have is that I think a non bayesian system can also be auditable and debuggable. It's going to depend a lot on what system it is. I mean, it's, it's easy to imagine systems which don't have those properties. And there are some systems that do as well. Um, and then with regards to where Bayes is helpful, um, in contextual bandits, there's sort of two root theories for how to think about um, exploration, basically. One of them is Thompson sampling, and the other one is, is upper confidence bounds. And I think the, the Thompson sampling is, um, I wouldn't strictly do Thompson sampling uh, uh, um, because it does have some weaknesses, but the Thompson sampling strategy of having a random distribution that you draw from is inherently more robust than the UCB strategy, particularly with respect to delays. So when you have delays in the system, a UCB strategy can do things that are sort of crazy, uh, while a Thompson sampling strategy is just sane and robust. Um, Ralph, you want to add something to that or? Yeah, uh, John, I um, yeah, thank you. I, I agree. I think um, in a linear or even a bilinear model, that's very interpretable. Um, it's often not expressive enough. So then uh, that's what I found. But it has it enjoys auditability and debuggability. I think uh, layered high -linear, highly nonlinear models are, are much less so. Um, maybe I wanted to at one point, uh, Cheng was asking, why would you want to evade it? In my experience, there is whenever you have a problem where um, the entities you need to reason about sort of uh, in terms of occurrence uh, follow almost a power law. So if you have, uh, let's say, gamers, you have a million of them, but there, there's like 1% uh, that plays 10% uh, of the matches, and then there is this home tail of 900,000 people that rarely play. Or you, you're an online retailer, and you know, or you're an online video store, and uh, you know, 5% of your movies or of your products make 90% of your views or of your purchases. So, and that's true for every that tail that remains. Um, when you have that situation, what I found is that using a model that uh, explicitly models the uncertainty in the entity um, leads to much more stability in the, I think we heard in the talk before, on those rarely seen instances. And so you're not making these... Um, you know, jumping or the model doesn't jump to conclusions too early because, I mean, uh, there's also ways to to uh, fudge this or to model this in a more frequentist approach where you then make heuristics based on number of occurrences of that entity of that instance. But it just falls out very naturally out of a Bayesian formulation or a Bayesian inference that it uh, adopts its per, sort of its step sizes of change with respect to the uh, information it was already able to gather, which is somewhat related, but not strictly with the um, number of occurrences. And I found if there is a situation in a production system where you have this power law of occurrences, um, I've typically seen it being advantageous to use it because it adopts the, uh, it, the, the uncertainty being tracked on the single entity really makes sure that the model doesn't get overly confident and makes not too big a jump in the parameter estimates on those tail. And the tail is not unimportant. I mean, the head is easy to predict whatever method you use, even averages typically work really well. So that's, uh, that's also an observation why, and I found from practice, in, uh, as a criteria, why it's very useful, um, actually powerful, to uh, use a Bayesian approach. 
Uh, can I just uh, add on, on top of it? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think I agree very much, but I think this, this actually made me think about two things. So one is when we talk performance, uh, I think both in research and in production, I think we also need to think about the metric because looking at different metric may lead to completely different decision on the necessity of, in general, any method. Because ex exactly the example of this big, small data. So in machine learning uh, evaluation, we may have like, you know, the top 20% of the data composed of like 80% of the rating. And if but in, in real life, maybe we care about the percentage of user being satisfied and happy. So, I mean, there are different situations and different way to look at things. And I just, uh, I mean, this is just an out of thin air example, but I do think uh, we need to be very, very careful on choosing the metrics to fulfill the real world application needs, uh, not only just taking our classic benchmark machine learning metric. And the second thing, I actually want to bring this a little bit to the causal end, because I think for many examples we talk about, I mean, the true scale, true match, I think many people on this call are very familiar with. And recently we also, uh, there is a causal component there. So I actually personally, I, I like this workshop that's really bring the patient and causal people together or people in between or, or just a part of it. I think because causality is something to model the true underlying data generation process. And I think just being patient is just the extremely natural way to align with it. And also like a causality in some way, I mean, if you look at the GDPR the requirement, no explainability, is actually counterfactual explainability. So I think there are a lot of components. And also, I mean, when it comes to causality, decision making, I feel, let, let's say people, we, we all know the benefits. And I just want to bring these components as well. And I, my personal belief is like a, being Bayesian and being causal. These are just naturally our, our great matches. <laughs> And uh, James, you, you you also have a hand. You're muted. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I really like the the kind of natural uh, kind of point that uh, Chang made. Um, so I've just if, if I look historically into like uh, research and how how Bayesian modeling has has kind of been applied to to uh, you know any kind of application domain. It used to be that um, you would have someone who uh, thinks of a, a problem, thinks very hard, and comes up with a bespoke Bayesian solution to it, which involves a model, probably a graphical model, a DAG, an inference method. You could spend two pages deriving the equations, um, and you know everyone was was winning from that. Um, it seems like the, the field of machine learning has accelerated so much um, that the, the game is this, the kind of the script is, has flipped a little bit or dramatically actually. So what's happening, at, well, from my perspective, what I see is that uh, people in research, people in industry um, are, are coming up with um, you know, methods that just work. So like heuristics, and I, I don't mean that in a dismissive tone, I mean that like things that really actually work when you know, rubber meets the road and um, Bayesian modeling is a way to understand why certain things work. So you could fit drop out into that, maybe suggesting gradient laundry of dynamics, um, uh, you know, for various other methods that, um, so Bayesian modeling is, is a lens through which to understand that. Um, and so going back to the teachable uh, criteria that Ralph was mentioning, I'm curious, I, I had a question for you. So I'm curious that how, how teachable do these methods have to be? So. Um, if, if someone says apply dropout with, with such and such a rate for, for these layers and uh, it, through some perspective that that's implementing variable inference, is that enough to, to, to kind of transfer the knowledge from generation to generation within, a, within the industry or, or do we really have to dig into the, the, the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of, of inference there? So, so I guess, um, James, just checking, the question was for me, right? Um, yeah, <clears throat> so I think Dropout is, is a good example um, because um, it needs to be more than just the understanding of the operation that's performed. So uh, I, I let me share an example uh, that makes it clearer. Um, uh, when we 
initially had developed the uh, true skill model. Think of it as a, it's really just a, a model where you have latent variables, skills of individuals, you have the observed one, which is based on the differences um, in the simplest case of two player games. Um, you know, you can uh, sort of uh, do the inference, you can uh, explain to anyone new on the team um, that effectively you're reverting the order of, of uh, P of X given Y to P of Y given X. Um, that's okay, but uh, then when something, so in this instance, what ended up happening is that uh, the, the, the convergence was too fast for the online game designer. So the online game designer said, that's all good. Mathematically, this, is, uh, this could be close to the information theoretic limit, meaning the smallest number of games suffice to learn what the skill of the individual is. But my, my customers, my gamers, they don't care. They want to have an up-leveling experience. So actually, I don't want your system because uh, if someone, half the population is, is weaker than 50% by definition, like they're actually in the, in the bottom half, um, they'll, they'll have a terrible experience within three or four games. They're going to be seeing on their, uh, on their rating that they just suck compared to you know, everyone. Of course, more than 50% of people think they're the top performers. Um, and so the, what the, the, uh, at the time, the, was a big debate. How do we actually slow this down? So if you don't understand where, how the algorithm, meaning the procedure that updates the skills are, as a result of a match outcome, come out of a model of that match outcome, you'd be tempted to just say, okay, I see the equation or I see the piece of code that does the update. I'm just gonna put in a little alpha factor that weighs everything down not understanding what the implication on the original model is, and you would actually risk to have uh, no longer an unbiased uh, estimate in the long run. And so you needed to, at the time, we needed to really sit down and explain that there's a way to model this. Basically, you wanna reduce the, you assume that there is more noise. Um, so you have to introduce a noise component. So your outcome is not just an outcome based on the differences of skills. Um, and there's a very natural way that translates into, uh, you know, it, it, it leads to effectively something like a down rating, but not exactly. But uh, if you don't understand the theory behind that the inference algorithm is a result of revert equation, and if you, you, know, you want to slow it down, you have to do this by modeling, making an extra assumption on the amount of noise that there is at the beginning at the first matches, or let's say the first 50 matches. Um, you end up as an, someone new on the team or a software engineer, really affecting the convergence properties of the system. So in that sense, that's what I meant by debuggability. This isn't really broken from a purely mathematical point of view, but it's broken from a customer experience, a user, user design point of view. And in order to fix those mistakes, um, you have to take the user, you know, user experience designer on the trip to understand that what you're, you know, the algorithm that, that falls out that can be implemented in any modern language is a result of a forward data generating process of the match outcome. And that takes a little longer because it's unnatural. People think of algorithms just as step procedures you execute. So I have a piece of memory that holds the skill for John and a piece of memory that holds the skill for Ralph. And then I, sub, you know, I subtract these two and I, I weigh them by a fixed magic factor alpha. Great, I get all that. But that's not what Bayesian inference is. That's the outcome of the uh, inference procedure on, on the model. That's why I think the teaching is harder. And that comes from, that's one of the first experiences I had. I hope that helps to explain. Thank, yeah. Thanks very much for um, all the great points. Um, I was actually expecting everyone would say, oh yeah, but we don't use Bayesian. But actually it turns out the conversation goes to the opposite direction where everyone seems to think Bayesians are useful in some way or not. So I'm gonna, kind of turn the table and uh, be the be the provoker to say that actually um i think in i guess a lot of us here are working on some form of um like online interactive system where you do observe a massive amount of uh, reward logging information like in the in, i guess in the terminology of ter, uh, the, the contextual bandits you observe a lot of context you observe some action then you observe reward um in most of the realistic systems you do actually because you have such a large space of context and action um it's 
almost impossible to actually see like an overlapping context action pair, especially if your action is like in the form of a slate, like in a page or a list. Um, so it's it's basically, I think information sharing is very important. And also the unevenness of information in this particular case actually makes like Bayesian inference so appealing that I would say reward modeling without Bayesian inference is impossible. I mean, again, I'm just provoking, but I, like that's kind of go the other, really go into the other direction. So I, I want to hear all your thoughts on this perspective. I guess we can start with the person who probably won't really use Bayesian inference um, in the production system. I guess um, maybe John, do you want to say something? So when you say reward modeling, you're trying to build, uh, can, you, can you be a little bit more precise about what you mean? Well, I mean, I, I guess I'm intentionally keeping everything vague, but by reward modeling, I really meant like you do revert, like when you observe certain kind of, like when, when you present certain recommendation to the user, you do observe some feedback from users and that you can consider those as reward. In the, I guess in the, in the, basically in the sense of like contextual bandits or RL, you do observe some either short-term or long-term reward. And uh, a lot of the, the model-based approach, you would want to actually model that reward in some way with a, with a model. So that's basically what I meant by like reward modeling. So can I think of reward modeling as reward prediction? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, a lot of systems actually do reward prediction, at least internally, right? So if you can, if you do reward prediction, then you can, uh, a reward predictor implies a policy by, you know, computing the argmax predicts the reward, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, VW does this internally. When, when you uh, are doing contextual balance, it reduces down to regression and the regression is gonna do some sort of uh, reward prediction essentially. And okay, so this may not be linear regression, it may be more complex, but it's still trying to do some sort of uh, predicting what the re reward is. So, so I think that's sort of not a, point of strong dispute. There are some approaches which don't do reward prediction, but um, I think that reward prediction is a very reasonable way to form a policy uh, in many situations. I think that where you might see differences is, for example, in um, how uncertainty is defined and used or whether or not it's defined and how it's used. Right. so it, um, when I think of contextual bandit learners, Often I'm thinking about some exploration strategy. When the exploration strategy, um, I tend to prefer things which use a stochastic process because that's robust delays and supports counterfactual reasoning with IPS like estimators. Okay, so that's, that's kind of compatible with Thompson sampling, but Thompson sampling from my perspective has some weaknesses. So in particular, it may make the probability of some actions be very low which I, I don't want to do because I, I want to be able to support kind of actual estimation of, of policies, right? And then from a learning perspective, Thompson sampling can sometimes uh, take a very long time to converge when almost all the policies go one way, but maybe some of them go the other way. Um, so so there, there's some, some, some things that I would quibble with here in, in terms of what is the, the, the best way to do things, but, um, the general strategy of sampling, I think, is, is good for exploration. Um, I, I don't know that it's necessary to compute um, uncertainties on reward estimators. Sometimes you can get away with not doing that, and, and it still works pretty effectively. Uh, sometimes, though, uncertainties on reward estimators can be helpful in terms of helping shape your exploration distribution, the ones you want to use. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that clarifies things, but um, uh, there are yeah, elements I, of, of sort of the Bayesian approach, which I consider very useful, and other elements which sometimes you can bypass, and, and that's okay in terms of giving you good performance. Yeah, I, I, I think that makes sense. And uh, I guess to maybe clarify just a little bit, I see it two hands, but I just want to, just want to maybe hear our thoughts on, because I think a lot of you just mentioned are probably more around the line of policy learning, which I guess 
is makes sense because I think the the flip side of reward modeling is to actually disregard that actually instead just to learn a policy, which is actually a very valid point. Um, I guess um, a, a lot of what you mentioned here are um, mostly around um, like explore, I, I guess um, in some sense, like in an online setting where you do constantly explore and then update your policy. Um, so I do you, do you think it might make more sense if you have, if you are in a more of an offline setting, um, I guess, um, or say off policy or offline setting, having a reward model would make more sense. So I think a standard way to create a policy is to, you know, predict the reward for an action in a context and then compute an arg max over the actions of the predicted reward. So it's very common uh, across many different systems. Um, and so I kind of feel like that the, the, the commonality of that doesn't have anything to do with online versus offline. It's just um, a standard way to think about how to solve these problems. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, so we have uh, actually a few hands. I actually, I don't know who raised up first. Maybe if you know that you can whoever raised the hand first can start asking questions and talk. I, sorry, <laughs> didn't keep track of the hands. I, I raised first, but I want to change the, the I want to challenge the assumption that based models in production work well, um, but with a different example. So if uh, James or uh, Diego want to comment on the reward learning on the policy uh, iteration, then, then mine is different. So I'd, I'd rather go back in the queue. Um. I just wanted to mention on, on, on reward modeling because in, in large scale problems that I'm facing, I cannot uh, reward model accurately. Uh, like if I try to choose uh, the right product to, sh to show on the right website in an ad, I have too many to pro products to choose from. I have millions of products and uh, in the data, there's millions of websites as well. And uh, the uh, algorithm that I'm, is gonna recommend products interacts with other parts of the system that make it so that I, even if I tried, I could not model the reward. So we use heuristics when implementing the algorithms on every step of the way. We have, uh, we scrape websites and, and categorize them using, try to predicting the category of a website. That's one part of the system. We, we break it into blocks. The, we analyze products uh, with uh, deep learning and try to predict the category of a product that makes another block. And then we observe on lots of examples who clicks on what in what context and, and there, uh, we also use a heuristic, which is, well, we come back to the argmax of trying to maximize the click probability in this case, uh, but it's not even remotely close to what is observed online. And then we do an, run an A-B test, and that is when we see uh, the actual reward, but, but uh, offline, I, I cannot uh, do a reward modeling properly. That was uh, just what I wanted to add. Yeah, and I just had a quick point about the reward versus policy question, which is, um, so actually um, policy learning, um, I mean, in, in some cases can also fall under Bayesian perspective. So uh, David Barber has done some re research with collaborators on casting RL as a virtual inference problem. And I know Sergey Levine has done similar work. Um, and that's, uh, that the outcome of that is a policy, but it's a, a kind of virtual inference perspective on, on what the policy is achieving. So um, just to make that quick point. And uh, so, I guess Ralph, you want, so, yeah. sorry, Ralph, so, go ahead. Yeah, so the one, uh, maybe, maybe to take a prerogative point, we talk a lot about there's advantages and we've seen um, based in inference or based in decision theory put in production, um, each of us have made their experiences. But I have, um, I have a set of applications where I have, I have theoretically seen Bayesian approaches being used and, and researched 20 years ago, but I haven't seen them in production. And that's when it comes to uh, auditory or, or uh, image data, like in particular when it's around predicting or generating images even though we kind of have a, there's like a whole body you know huge body of literature of the compositionality uh, of them and ever we had an application whether it was so one project i once worked on was the ripeness prediction of fruit 
um, when you take a near infrared camera, um, that was in principle, you had knowledge of the, the imaging system um, as a special sensor. Yet the, 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 it wasn't really able, we weren't really able to model, of course, a single pixel that we observed. And so the best systems we found were actually just the um, deep learning based systems or, or layered function architectures that learn from them. And similarly for data where the granularity of the individual observation is so small, let's see like a, uh, yeah. Audio, audio signals from uh, from speaker systems or, or, or microphone array systems. So I have maybe that's a statement where I haven't really seen Bayesian systems put to use when could use when uh, when the information to be modeled was at such a fine level of granularity. It wasn't an entity like a, a gamer or a product or a customer or a movie, but it was a pixel or an amplitude um, that. In production, I have not seen any. I know there is some great research that uh, is going on between, uh, let's say, mid 90s to mid 2000s in the field. But uh, I postulate that that's really hard and not, not that much in production. Chen, you want, uh, you have a hand? Uh, yeah, so I just want to kind of re ask the question why not? I mean, uh, we all see like uh, in image analysis is not in production. Oh, what's the reason? Is that is a hard question or it's a performance question? I think um, for me personally, I kind of feel uh, like performance in terms of just accuracy, let's say how many dogs we see as dog and this type of thing. Uh, it's being patient. We don't really see much advantage uh, if you just measure uh, performance by classification accuracy. But the kind of, I also feel like, uh, I mean, it's a kind of a trend of, research like a, it's more a research driven by real world need because 10 years ago when we barely can uh, can classify dog and cats be able to do that is a goal and it was a good goal for people to work on and to make it useful in real life but now ways of the system become more and more successful and i think with all different country legal privacy fairness you know <laughs> everything coming to place and people ask for uncertainty more so I feel these other metrics start to play a little bit more and more important role. And when this different metric, other than a simple accuracy, which is potentially the, the correct first metric to look into, start to play more important role in different application. I think this is where maybe answers the question, why like a, it applies to not only being Bayesian or you know being causal, like just put it <laughs> put these words here. Like why this method, like uh, in theory, uh, has an advantage you haven't made it into production system in this application. Do you think maybe this is a time to think to put this method in production system? And I also want to hear everyone's opinion on why why it hasn't been, and do you think will it? <laughs> So I suspect there's a cascading effect here where um, Bayesian neural networks, for example, uh, require a bit more compute to use. And then the people who are empirical try to skip things so they can, uh, you know, run faster. And then the, the people who are empirical kind of uh, discover tweaks to make things better. And these, these tweaks are in the update rule and representation and all these different things. So they're busy doing the gradient descent. And, and so there's, there's like, the, but it's not just like the great descent of the equations, it's more like a, like a genetic algorithm kind of gradient descent where they're, they're coming up with a bunch of tweaks uh, and they're, they're sharing these tweaks amongst each other and they're trying different things. And that, that, that level of many people trying many different things just doesn't happen with the Bayesian neural networks. Anyone else also has an answer to that? Um, I think Cheng, um, I, I very much like uh, like your argument here. I mean, I think right now the focus has been predominantly on pure predictive accuracy, um, and that's won the you know offline online the the, the benchmarks clearly, um, but explainability and fairness become more and more criteria. And I think 
But that's coming back to this idea of how easy is it to debug um, systems that are non-linear. Um, and and uh, it could well be that I, I could imagine that adding that to the uh, success criteria will actually bring bring some of the research that's happening in the uh, in Bayesian models, whether it's Bayesian neural networks or 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 other models of images, much more interesting and ready for production. I I do think so. As I said at the beginning, just um, you know, slaving a, a massive sampling over neural networks are already expensive to compute. Uh, I mean, the biggest amount of research of putting neural networks into production is actually how do we avoid them draining the battery to no end? Um, so meaning you approximate them with the least computation possible so that they run at a cost-effective rate, either in energy or in money. But I think uh, it is it has probably to do with the fact that pure predictive accuracy on images and sound were the only criteria for the past five, five years. And that's probably uh, made the non-basing systems dominate. And Diego? Yeah, I, and I sorry, I, 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 um, sorry, I just want to say one thing. I, I don't want to be the, the barrier of bad news, but uh, we are almost at time. So I want to stop and uh, any closing thoughts. But yes, Diego, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that when you go to production, you have a specific problem to solve and, and people tend to or at least I do, go to production with the quickest solution that you can imagine, and it's generally not Bayesian. Uh, and then once it's there, as, as uh, I think uh, Ralph said, uh, that um, people try to iterate on it. And there's so many possible things that you can already iterate on on a simple system that you, it's kind of hard to rethink about the whole thing and then redesign the entire Bayesian system. So it, it requires a lot of, 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 of drive and, and time before you can see a, a good working Bayesian system in production. And uh, to me, what has been a problem in, in terms of, of bringing it to the next level is, is uh, I, I don't know if anybody has ever implemented something like a Metropolis Hastings in production with, with a large scales, at a very large scale, but I, I, I'm, we're using more like KNN methods, uh, nearest neighbors, and, and that is reliable and it works very well. Uh, so if you have experience with that, reach out to me, I'm curious. And James. Yeah, I, I really agree with the points about practicality. I mean, um, even if you think of something like bootstrap Thompson sampling, which is, you know, it should be the easiest to, to um, kind of get into production, that's already, you know, multiplying by a factor of, what is it, like 20, the, the cost of, for running the, the neural network. Um, and, you know, if you switch to something like variational inference, variational inference which would uh, hopefully be an alternative to MCMC, then, um, it's almost like, what's the point? Because um, you're, you're, so if you're switching from predictive accuracy to let's say the outcome of maybe a B test, then you care about exploration uh, in, in, uh, in principle. So exploration, exploitation, uh, the variational inference will underestimate the, the, the uh, uncertainty. So it's, it doesn't have that kind of um, reliability that, that MCMC might have. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, what we're really missing is the, the loop back to research. So um, industry has released a few data sets, um, which are static, and that's uh, spurred on a lot of research into you know, recommended systems or you know, image classification. Um, if we're talking about interaction now, um, exploration, exploitation with interaction, we need a different kind of data set release. And so that's why I'm kind of very excited about simulation as, as a way to, to communicate between industry and, and uh, academia. You know, if we can release a credible simulator then um, we can hopefully spur some more uh, interest in this kind of interactive problems. Uh, that would be one way of, of that communication. Obviously, there's, there's others that are based on uh, different theories. OK, any other closing thoughts? I think that's a very good point. Any other closing thoughts? Okay, looks like we are at the time. Um, Only okay. just thank you for organizing this. Oh yeah, sure. Thank you. I mean, thanks David who thank did you. most of the, like 99% of the work, but uh, yes, I, I really enjoyed the workshop so far. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for all the panelists for all the lively discussion. The time really passed fast when we are having fun. So, um, but uh, yeah, it has to move on to the next session, which um, I think is the, the poster session. So,